walk in the courtroom, I would ask you to leave. If you want to use your phone, you have a courtroom right next door on the rollover room, so if you want to use your phone on that one, there was no food, eating, sleeping, and no talk in the courtroom. This is the only warning I'm giving you. If you have to tell you, take your cell phone out, and you catch you talking, you can ask you to leave. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Marshall, would you approach, please? The matter of State of Connecticut versus Michelle Traconis. May the court have the appearances of the parties, please. Good morning, Your Honor. Michelle Manning for the state. Your Honor, good morning. May it please the court, Sean McGinnis for the state. Good morning, Your Honor. Attorney John Schoenhorn representing Michelle Traconis, who is seated to my left. Michelle. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Audrey Felsen for Michelle Traconis. Thank you. There were a number of motions filed yesterday, and there were a number of motions filed today by the defense. What the court intends to do is just indicate what those motions are. The court will not act on all of those motions today. Filed January 10th, 2024 motion for sequestration of witnesses. Now the court will act on that motion today. So what the court will do is just hear from Attorney Schoenhorn on that motion. I ask that the court grant that motion as a matter of course, and it would apply to both sides. Does the state wish to be heard? Yes, Judge. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, well, Your Honor, the uh, part of my uh, issue with the defense's motion has been alleviated by Attorney Schoenhorn's representation that it would apply to both sides. Um, so with that, obviously, we don't have any objection to uh, the law enforcement personnel and, and most of the witnesses being sequestered. However, um, there are members of the Farber family, Your Honor, who wish to be present that are potential witnesses in this case. And I'll just direct the court to State versus Swinton, which is 268 Con 781. It's a 2004 case um, in which uh, the trial court um, indicated when there's a request for the victim's family to remain um, that it would balance the interests of both parties. Specifically, I believe that a fair reading of Swinton is that the court, the defense needs to identify specifically which members of the victim's family they want excluded. And I think the court needs to balance whether or not their presence during particular portions of testimony uh, could potentially influence their uh, trial testimony. And so I think following Swinton, Your Honor, it's incumbent upon the defense to identify specifically who from the victim's family they want excluded. And then I think they need to make a proffer as to how their testimony can be influenced. So we would ask that the court grant the motion with the caveat that the victim's family be allowed to remain in the court. You wish to be heard, counsel? Yes, uh, twofold. The first is, I do not know what the family is going to testify to. So it's incumbent upon the state to make a proffer. How am I to make a proffer as to how it will be influenced by other people's testimony unless I know that? So I think that he's put the cart before the horse. If the court were going to, however, consider that uh, request by the state, which is, uh, it's discretionary, but it also goes to the issue of a fair trial and due process, they would ask the same for my client's family. As the court is aware, the court has already heard during uh, pretrial hearings from my client's mother, um, who's present in the courtroom. And if something arises where she might have to testify to some of the matters that she was actually present for, uh, I would ask for that same consideration. But until the state indicates the nature of the testimony, if in, in fact it does not involve any uh, evidence that would be influenced by someone else, that's a little bit different uh, than, but the normal procedure is that all witnesses that are going to be called are sequestered, and that was what we would do if we were going to call any of the members of the family ourselves. Thank you. Counsel. So just briefly on that, Judge, that's uh, incongruent with Swinton, which I've cited to the court. I think it's incumbent upon the defense to indicate <coughs> why they think um, a victim's uh, family needs to be excluded from the courtroom. And the difference, of course, here 
is that the defendant's family and the victim's family are not similarly situated. Article 8 of the Connecticut Constitution specifically uh, delineates certain victims' rights, including the right to attend court proceedings. And so um, therein lies the difference between uh, the uh, Farber family and the defendant's family. So I agree the defense witnesses should be excluded, uh, but the Farber family should be allowed to remain. Thank you. Well, it is clear that there are competing interests. However, there is a constitutional provision that would allow, and this court will use the term according to the constitutional provision, would allow the victims to be present at every stage of the proceeding. That does not mean the victims can be heard at every stage of the proceeding. So the court is going to uh, deny the defense's request that the state identify the members of the family and the nature of the testimony it intends to elicit. However, the court will grant the balance of the motion indicating that no witness who testifies will be allowed to discuss their testimony after that testimony has been elicited with any other witness who has not yet testified. File January 10th, 2024, a motion in limine to preclude hearsay statements by third parties without determination of co-conspirator status. The court believes it does not have to rule on that today. Also, there was a memorandum in support of that motion. January 10th filing, 2024, motion in limine regarding prior bad acts of the defendant. Well, the court probably is not going to anticipate that testimony to come forward today if it were going to be elicited. Probably not today, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Filed January 10th, 2024, motion to preclude layperson testimony regarding cellular site location and geofence evidence. That testimony is not likely to be elicited today, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. January 10th, 2024, motion in limine to preclude pejorative reference to written timelines. That is not going to be elicited today, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Filed January 10th, 2024, motion in limine to preclude references to victims. Well, that probably is going to be woven throughout the trial. So the court will hear from Attorney Schoen on it. Yes, um, I believe that the uh, case law that I cite in here, particularly the Warholic case, is on point that the state has to prove that the uh, that Jennifer Dulos was a, quote, victim, unquote. Whatever position we may or may not take, whatever we may think about it, it is something that has to be proved. The case law is clear that unless we stipulate or agree that someone constituted a, quote, victim, unquote, and I would note, I'm not raising that with regard to the Farber family. They have an interest in the matter for the time being, but. That's something that has to be proven by the state. At this point, there is no such evidence. And the bottom line is that there have been many cases that have resulted. It's either reversible to allow the state, or for that matter, the court, to refer to any uh, party or any uh, individuals discussed as a, quote, victim, unquote. Or it might be harmless error in certain cases, but it's still error. So I want to just make sure that that is not something that gets slipped, and that's why I'm filing it as a motion. It might be accidental, but the bottom line is, I don't have any problem with people discussing her by name. They can refer to Miss Dulos, they can call her Jennifer Dulos, they can call her by her first name, um, or the missing person. What I'm concerned about is starting off suggesting that she's, quote, the victim, unquote, in this case. Might be different if this was Fotis Dulos's trial, but it's not. I'm, I'm hard pressed to see how it would be any different in any trial. Uh, the law is the law on this judge, and you know I think we did this dance during voir dire a little bit. 
the state intends to refer to um, Ms. Barbara Dulos as either her name uh, or potentially the alleged victim um, during the course of the trial. And I would just direct the court to State versus Warholic, which is the case that uh, the defense cited. And, and Warholic, uh, specifically, um, along with State versus Smith, which is cited in Warholic, um, permits or tacitly indicates that the use of the term alleged victim is different than the term victim itself. And so we are going to be referring to her at times as the alleged victim. Um, we think that that's appropriate. It's alleged in the information that she is, in fact, the victim. And uh, so that's how we're going to conduct ourselves during the course of the trial. Thank you. The court is going to read the information to the jury. And that information is going to include uh, language in reference to the name Jennifer Farber Dulos. The designation as an alleged victim would arouse no prejudice. So the reference to victim itself is frowned upon, but alleged victim is acceptable. So the motion is essentially granted in part. January 10th, 2024, motion in limine to preclude law enforcement opinion regarding the credibility or truthfulness of the defendant. That testimony is not likely to be elicited today, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Thank you. Filed January 10th, 2024, motion in limine to preclude reference to the defendant's assertion of her Miranda rights, including request for presence of counsel. Attorney show showing on. During the hearing on the uh, interrogation videos, portions were uh, played by the state involving the uh, trip from what, the time of her arrest where they tried to uh, get her to waive her right to counsel. She said, no, I want to speak to my attorney. And then there's that middle of the night, I'll call it interrogation. They want to just call it, you know, making sure that Mr. Conus is all right. But again, where she asserts her right uh, to counsel at that point, I'm assuming, but I don't know, that the state does not intend to offer those, uh, the, any audio portion of those recordings. And I assume that if anything they're going to play begins in the uh, afternoon where attorney Bowman is present with um, Ms. Traconis. This is to make sure that that doesn't suddenly come in, either through a witness or through the uh, accidental playing of that video. Good morning again, Judge. Um, just a, a couple of things on this. Uh, firstly, I hadn't anticipated that we were going to be hearing argument on, on this particular motion today, just because I think we're several days away from uh, introducing any portion of the defendant's uh, recorded interviews. But I'll just note for the record that um, it is uh, inaccurate when the defense says that there's no probative value whatsoever to an invocation. In fact, our case law permits an invocation to show uh, the sequence of events. Now, it can't be used by the jury to draw an adverse inference of guilt. That I agree with them on. But I'll note the interpreter um, who is uh, translating what I say to the defendant's ears right now. And I raise that, Judge, because if there's going to be any sort of claim uh, during the course of cross-examination or the trial that the defendant did not understand her Miranda rights and the fact that she invoked multiple times to the police in advance of that interview, which we're going to be playing, then we think that the defense opens the door to all these issues in terms of rebutting the inference that she didn't understand her rights. And so I would ask the court not to act on this motion now. I think this issue is going to be fluid. Uh, but I disagree with the defense that an invocation could never come into evidence because that's simply completely contrary to the case law. Thank you. Again, this testimony is not going to be elicited today. The court would also indicate that the court denied the defense's motion to suppress those eight hours of essentially interrogation by the police of the defendant. 
January 11, 2024, filed today, motion in limine to preclude the use of inconclusive and, in quotes, cannot be eliminated, in quote, DNA results. That's not likely to be elicited today. January 11, filed today, motion to preclude irrelevant videos or opinion of unidentified bicyclist. Is that unlikely to be elicited today? Judge, it is. And I do just, can I just have a moment to consult yes. with Attorney Shawhorn because we don't have copies of these. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May we take up the motions that were filed today, perhaps at a, a break, or, or, or if the court wants to know what they are for the record, of course. I just, we don't have copy right now, so. Thank you. The court still wants to put on the record what was filed sure. today. Sure. And we need not, because the state is just receiving copies, we need not take up any of the balance of the motions. Filed today, January 11th, 2024, motion and lemony to preclude all evidence of alleged domestic discord between Fotis Dulos and Jennifer Dulos. Filed today, January 11, 2024, motion to preclude videos or opinions of unidentified red truck. Filed today, January 11, 2024, motion in limine to preclude speculation, lay opinion, and prejudicial descriptions of blood-like stains is that likely to come in today? Yes, Your Honor, that is likely to come today. May I have a copy of that? Attorney <clears throat> Sean do you wish to be heard? Yes, I uh, mentioned when I met with the state yesterday afternoon that um, I was working on that motion. This, this motion is in conjunction with the, um, there's two motions, there's the, uh, the presumptive blood testing evidence and this motion together, I cite the same case, State versus Moody, and uh, I'll just quote, because I quoted in my motion, it specifically says, the result of the presumptive test for blood has no probative value whatsoever. The test result did nothing toward establishing the likelihood of the presence of human blood. In that case, I put in brackets, it's on a piece of clothing. Uh, therefore, we hold that the test result was entirely irrelevant, and thus the trial court abused its discretion by admitting it into evidence. And that's on page 628 of the Moody case. I also cite two out-of-state cases, which, if I recall, are also um, stand for the same proposition um, from uh, New Jersey and Arkansas. It's one thing for a witness to say, well, I saw something that, you know, was red or it looked like a stain, so I took pictures of it. I'm not going to object to that. But having a police officer say something is blood or blood-like or that they sprayed it with luminol or there's something else called um, KM, which is called Castle-Meyer, that's just a reagent test that glows if something to start, but rust, all these other things also glow. So this case, as far as I, and I asked the court to look at it before ruling on that, specifically says there was abuse of discretion even allow it in. Many of the items that they, they sprayed this on turns out not even to be human, not even to be organic. So it will confuse the jury, especially early on in the case. The state can put on witnesses if they took pictures of a bunch of things, but I object if they're going to try and say, well, we sprayed it and it, you know, gave us a presumptive test when the case law says it's not to come in for any purpose whatsoever. Well, that addresses the motion for the presumptive blood testing. The court is interested first in the motion concerning the description of blood-like stains. I would note that um, it seems to me, and I've read hundreds of reports, anything that was brown, greasy looking, or red, they called blood-like. 
And it turns out many of those things, I don't have to I list them, but many of those things were tested, found not to contain blood. So it's the same thing. It's a pejorative description of an item. They can say it was a brown stain, it was a red stain. I'm not going to object to that. It's their idea of calling it blood life. So it starts the case off with the jury thinking, aha, we don't even need to hear from any uh, expert on whether it's blood or not. The first thing we're going to hear is the police have decided this is blood, and that's all we need to hear. So I don't know how the court will be able to instruct the jury to disregard that once it comes out. That's why I'm filing it as a motion. In the if I may, Your Honor. Uh, but counsel did mention yesterday that he would be objecting to uh, this term. However, I did not get his motion or the case. Um, what I would indicate with respect to Moody, Your Honor, it's a 1999, or I'm sorry, a 1990 case where the sole uh, evidence relating to a blood-like stain that was tested was a small drop on a sole of a shoe that was so small that after the presumptive test was done, no further testing could be done. The court over the next 28 years has walked back Moody and relied more on Schaefer, which is a 1978 case, and I can give the case citation to the court, which, if I can have a moment, which actually indicates that a layperson may also testify as to their observations of a item being blood. The court has walked that back in State v. Walked back Moody, I should say, in State v. Grant, which is 286 Con 499, a 2008 case, and indicates that um, Moody distinguishes Moody because it was based on such a small piece of item, a small droplet, that, and I'll just read this straight straight through. It says, presumably, therefore, it had been too small for a person of ordinary knowledge or experience to make any reasonable inference on its, on its nature of, on the basis of personal observation. And they go on to conclude that Schaefer <coughs> sets forth a better rule. Uh, I do think also I would refer your honor's attention to State v. Downing, which is uh, 68 Con App 388 2002 case. That case actually also walks back Moody and indicates that it's not just the fact that you have a droplet that looks like a blood-like stain. It's in context also. There are other considerations, such as was it tested later? Where is there any uh, evidence in the entire case itself or presented in the testimony? Uh, in that case, specifically, it indicates the stains, uh, evidence that the stains were blood were based on factors such as their color, their shape, their location in the scene or the area all things that were taken into account to fall more in line with Schaefer than Moody. So the state would object. Very briefly, briefly counsel. The items that are going to be testified to are tiny little drops. There is not a large pool of anything. And so it's the, those cases do not apply. The fact that a lay witness might say it looked like blood. There was a, a body on the ground. There was blood next to it. I'm not objecting to anything like this. I'm objecting to police officers saying, oh, there are these drops here. Some of them, some of them, they're very small. Some of them were tested. Some were not. And I'm more concerned that they're using this reagent spray, which no cases, and, and I'm surprised to hear the state suggesting that the appellate court overruled the Supreme Court, which in my experience, has never happened, but that the fact that there may be some fact-specific cases where something is, is uh, in a different scenario doesn't overrule. Moody has not been overruled. And I'm more concerned that the both the description of these tiny little dots saying, oh, that's blood or blood life, and then it gets carried over, and then the, it gets tested at the laboratory, and it's not blood. It's not blood-like. It's not even organic to put that idea in the head. I and mean, there are these little tiny drops is what we're talking about. The suggestion that there's a large pool of blood as was placed in the public record in the arrest warrant simply is not true. So for the state or for the court for that matter to suggest that, well, maybe there'll be harmless error. Or maybe we can distinguish that case. The whole point of these filing these motions <laughs> is to prevent that kind of prejudice from happening. So based on that, Your Honor, I'm asking the court to grant the motion. Thank you. Of course, if there were testimony of this nature, 
What did you see? I saw blood. There'd be an objection. What's the objection? Foundation, it's a stain. Here, blood-like stains uh, does not have the same force. In addition, uh, one cannot assume that the jury will close its ears to cross-examination and not be overwhelmed by the phrase blood-like stain. So the motion is denied. Now concerning the, the presumptive blood testing, that is not likely to come into evidence today, correct? It will tomorrow, Your Honor. Okay, well, we will take it up tomorrow. Thank you. Is the jury ready? Yes, Your Honor. You can bring them in. time when the jury is brought in and the attendance is taken, no identifying information will be disclosed of any juror. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First, we will take the attendance, and then you'll be sworn in.
what the court is going to do is talk to you about some of the instructions that shall guide your deliberations. It will also include a reading of the information again, which you have already heard. The court must read it again. This is a criminal case. The state has brought charges against Michelle Triconis, and the court will now read that information. Paul J. Forensic, state's attorney for the Ju Judicial District of Stamford, Norwalk, charges count one conspiracy to commit murder. At various times and in various locations, including but not limited to the town of New Canaan on or about the 24th day of May 2019, in the area of 69 Wells Lane, Michelle Traconis, with intent that conduct constituting the crime of murder be performed, did agree with Fotis Dulos and other persons to engage in and cause the performance of that conduct and one of them did commit an overt act in pursuance of the conspiracy. To wit, Fotis Dulos did assault Jennifer Farber Dulos in her home on the 24th day of May 2019 with the intent to restrain and kill her in violation of sections 53A-48A and 53A-54A subsection A of the Connecticut General Statute. Count two conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence. And the aforesaid state's attorney further accuses the defendant, Michelle Traconis, of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence and charges that on or about the 24th day of May 2019, in the city of Hartford, in the area of Albany Avenue, the defendant, Michelle Traconis, with the intent that conduct constituting the crime of tampering with physical evidence be performed, did agree with Fotis Dulos to engage in and cause the performance of that conduct. And one of them did commit an overt act in pursuance of the conspiracy to wit, the defendant Michelle Traconis traveled with Fotis Dulos to the Hartford area for the purpose of disposal of physical evidence relating to the murder of Jennifer Farber Dulos in the city of Hartford on the 24th day of May 2019 in violation of section 53A-48 and 53A-155A1 of the Connecticut General Statute. Count three, tampering with physical evidence. And the aforesaid state's attorney further accuses the defendant, Michelle Traconis, of tampering with physical evidence and charges that on or about the 24th day of May 2019, within the city of Hartford, in the area of Albany Avenue, the defendant, Michelle Traconis, believing that a criminal investigation conducted by a law enforcement agency was pending and about to be instituted, and an official proceeding was pending and about to be instituted, <coughs> did alter, destroy, conceal, and remove a thing with the purpose to impair its availability in that criminal investigation and official proceeding. In violation of section 53A-155A1 and 53A-8A of the Connecticut General Statute. Count four, conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence. And the aforesaid state's attorney further accuses the defendant, Michelle Traconis, of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence and charges that on or about the 29th day of May 2019 in the town of Avon, in the area of 265 West Main Street, the defendant, Michelle Traconis, with the intent that conduct constituting the crime of tampering with physical evidence be performed did agree with Fotis Dulos to engage in and cause the performance of that conduct, and one of them did commit an overt act in pursuance of the conspiracy, to wit, Fotis Dulos did transport a 2001 Toyota Tacoma used in the commission of the murder of Jennifer Farber Dulos to Russell Speeder's car wash in Avon on the 29th day of May 2019 
for the purpose of having evidence relating to that murder concealed and destroyed in violation of sections 53A-48A and 53A-155A1 of the Connecticut General Statute. Count five, tampering with physical evidence. And the aforesaid state's attorney further accuses the defendant, Michelle Traconis, of tampering with physical evidence and charges that on or about the 29th day of May, 2019, within the town of Avon, in the area of 265 West Main Street, the defendant, Michelle Traconis, believing that a criminal investigation conducted by a law enforcement agency was pending and about to be instituted and an official proceeding was pending and about to be instituted, did alter, destroy, conceal, and remove a thing with the purpose to impair its availability in that criminal investigation and official proceeding in violation of section 53A-155A1 and 53A-8A of the Connecticut General Statutes, and finally count six, hindering prosecution in the second degree. And the aforesaid state's attorney further accuses the defendant, Michelle Traconis, of hindering prosecution in the second degree and charges that on or about the 29th day of May 2019 in the town of Avon, in the area of 265 West Main Street, the defendant, Michelle Traconis, did render criminal assistance to another person when, with intent to prevent, hinder, and delay the discovery and apprehension of, and the lodging of a criminal charge against Fotis Dulos, or Dulos rather, whom she knew and believed had committed a class A felony to wit murder, did provide Fotis Dulos with transportation and other means of avoiding discovery and apprehension in support of Fotis Dulos's effort to conceal, alter, and destroy evidence of the murder contained within a 2001 Toyota Tacoma in violation of sections 53A-165A3 and 53A-166 of the Connecticut General Statute. Now, as mentioned before, the information that the court has just read is not evidence. It is only the formal means of bringing charges, and you may not consider the information as evidence. You may not draw any inference of guilt because the defendant has been arrested and charged. Each charge is set forth in the information as what is called a separate count. In deciding the case, you must consider each charge separately. Every defendant in a criminal case is presumed innocent. And as we explained to you earlier, the presumption of innocence works this way. If you were asked right now whether Michelle Traconis was guilty or innocent, the answer is not, I don't know. The answer is not guilty because you have heard nothing to overcome the presumption of innocence. That presumption remains unless you unanimously decide that the state has proven guilt beyond a reasonable, uh, reasonable doubt for each of the offenses. The burden is on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And that is called the burden of proof. The burden of proof never shifts to the defendant. If you do not find at the conclusion of all of the evidence that the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant has committed every element of an offense, you must find the defendant not guilty of that offense. On the other hand, if you are satisfied that the evidence establishes guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, you should not hesitate to find the defendant guilty. The procedure for the trial is as follows. After these instructions, the state will present its evidence. Of course, the defendant has the right to cross-examine. The defendant may, if he chooses, present evidence. As you recall, the defendant is presumed innocent. The defendant does not have to prove innocence. If the defendant chooses to present evidence, the state may have the opportunity to present what is called rebuttal evidence. After all of the evidence has been presented, the lawyers will make their closing arguments. The closing arguments themselves are not evidence. You may consider the arguments in your deliberations, but those arguments do not constitute evidence. 
The state will argue first, this is in regard to the closing argument, according to our rules, and then the defendant will argue. The state has the opportunity to argue after the defense. The defense will not have a second opportunity to argue. However, each side receives the same amount of time for argument. The state may break its argument, however, into two parts if it chooses. <clears throat> when the arguments have been completed, the court will instruct you on the law which applies in this case, and you must apply the law as the court instructs. After the instructions, you will be sent to the jury room to begin your deliberations. This is the first time you will discuss the case with your fellow jurors and with no one else. Once deliberations start, all deliberations are to be conducted in the jury room when all of the jurors are present. When you deliberate, you apply the law as the court will instruct to the facts in the case. And this is how you reach your verdict, and your verdict has to be unanimous. The court's responsibility includes conducting the trial in an orderly and a fair and an efficient manner. It also includes ruling on questions of law arising during the trial and instructing you on the law as it applies in this case. It is your duty to accept the law as the court states it. During the trial, the court will have to rule on objections and make comments to counsel. The court may also ask questions of witnesses. And of course, tell you what the law is. The rulings, the questions to witnesses, the comments and the instructions are not to be taken by you as any indication of this court's opinion concerning how you should determine the facts in this case. If you come to believe that this court has expressed or intimated any opinion concerning the facts, you should ignore the opinion you believe the court has formed. And as stated earlier, the role the court has is to ensure a fair trial so that you may decide the case. As jurors, you may disregard all comments the court makes in arriving at your own findings. You must not take anything the court says or does during the trial as an indication of what the court thinks of the evidence or what your verdict should be. You are the sole and exclusive judges of the facts, and you determine the weight of the evidence that you will hear. You determine the value and the effect of the evidence, and you determine the credibility of witnesses. You must consider and weigh the testimony of all the witnesses who appear before you, and you alone are to determine whether to believe any witness and the extent to which any witness should be believed. It is your duty to resolve any conflicts in the testimony and to determine where the truth is. You may draw any and all inferences from the evidence which reasonably and logically flow from the evidence. Now, what will the evidence consist of? The evidence will consist of the testimony of witnesses, documents, and other materials admitted as exhibits. Evidence may also consist of any facts on which the lawyers agree or which the court may instruct you to accept. The following do not constitute evidence, and you may not consider them as evidence in deciding the facts of the case. Statements and arguments by the attorneys are not evidence. Questions and objections of the attorneys are not evidence. And the testimony which the court indicates to you you should disregard should not be considered. Now, there are two kinds of evidence, direct and circumstantial. Direct evidence is testimony by a witness about what that witness personally saw or heard or did. And circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence, that is, evidence from which you can infer another fact. Now, this example has been used many times. If you wake up in the morning and you see the roadway is wet, the inference that you can draw is that it rained during the night. However, the wet roadway is circumstantial evidence that it had rained. Other evidence may provide another explanation, such as a sanitation truck hosing down the street. 
Therefore, before you decide a fact has been proven by circumstantial evidence, you must consider all of the evidence in the light of reason, experience, and common sense. In deciding the case, you may consider both direct and circumstantial evidence. The law gives you permission to give equal weight to both direct and circumstantial evidence. You must decide how much weight to give any evidence. Some evidence may be admitted for a limited purpose, and if the court instructs you to consider some piece of evidence for a limited purpose, you must consider it for that purpose and for no other purpose. Now, in deciding the facts of the case, you judge the credibility of the witnesses. You will have to decide which witnesses to believe or not believe and the extent to which you credit any witness's testimony. You may believe everything a witness says or only part of it, or you may believe none of it. You may not credit or discredit a witness based solely on which side has called the witness. Now, police officers will testify in this trial, and you must determine the credibility of police officials in the same way and by the same standards as you would evaluate the testimony of any witness. The testimony of a police official is entitled to no special or exclusive weight merely because it comes from a police official. You should recall his or her demeanor on the stand and manner of testifying and weigh it just as carefully as you would the testimony of any other witness. You should neither believe nor disbelieve the testimony of a police official just because he or she is a police official. The court will talk to you now about objections. During the trial, one lawyer may object to a question asked by another. It is the lawyer's responsibility to object to a question if he or she thinks the answer is inadmissible according to the rules of evidence. You should not hold anything against the lawyer because he or she objects to a question. After the objection is made, the court will rule on the objection. If the objection is sustained, the question will not be answered. You should not speculate about what the answer would have been or the reason the question was asked. If the objection is overruled, the witness will be permitted to answer the question. There may be times when you may be excused so that the lawyers can make more extensive arguments concerning the objections, and those arguments may include a discussion of evidence which the court may eventually exclude. You will be excused so that you do not hear evidence that is not properly admissible. Now, you have taken an oath that will govern your conduct, and from this point, or from the point you took the oath until the court discharges you, after you have rendered a verdict, that oath remains in effect. The oath and the rules place you under an obligation to do certain things and to avoid certain things. And the court will review those now. First, you must decide the case based on the evidence presented here in court and the law as the court will explain it. Second, do not make up your mind about the verdict until after you have heard all of the evidence the closing arguments of the lawyers, the instructions on the law, and after you and your fellow jurors have discussed the evidence. You may not perform any investigations or research or experiments of any kind on your own, either individually or as a group. Do not visit the scenes of any of the places mentioned in the course of the evidence. Of course, if you are already familiar with any of these places or scenes, you cannot erase that from your memory. Do not research anything online. Do not consult dictionaries for the meanings of words or any other reference material for general information on any subject that comes up during the trial. Do not review any statutes that have been referred to. And the reason is that the parties have a right to have the case decided on the evidence presented here in court. If you conduct some research and investigation, the verdict may be the product of evidence the parties had no opportunity about which to ask questions during direct and cross-examination. If you see media reports anywhere, avoid them. That includes radio, television, live stream, blogs, any internet site. 
They may contain information that has not been introduced here, and that information may be inaccurate. The court will also indicate to you, do not watch any recordings of the trial at any time before you render a verdict. So in other words, when you go home, do not decide to go to a website to review the evidence that was presented here in court. That's like taking your notes home, which are not allowed. In addition to that, you may hear commentary by commentators about the evidence. Those commentators may or may not have been here, and they may taint the way you view the evidence. Also, you may not talk to members of your family or friends or coworkers about the case. You may not talk to anyone who has anything to do with this case about the case. So in other words, do not try to talk to the lawyers or the marshals or the clerk. You may not ask any acquaintances who are lawyers or law enforcement personnel for advice or information about matters related to the case. The reason for these precautions is that in talking to others, you may be influenced by matters that have not been introduced as evidence in this courtroom, and that would not be fair to the parties and may result in a verdict based on something other than the evidence and the law. And you may not talk to each other about the case. Even if you go to lunch together, you may not talk to each other about the case. Until all of the evidence is in, you've heard the closing arguments, you've heard the instructions on the law, and the court instructs you to deliberate in the deliberation room. The problem with discussing the case before all of these things occur is that you may begin to take positions on the case before you have heard the entire case. And you may stake out your positions before you hear all of the evidence, and you may be inclined not to deliberate with an open mind. To be fair and to fulfill your obligations as jurors, you must resist the temptation to discuss the case with each other before you are supposed to. Now, what happens if you do discuss the case with each other before deliberations? In some cases, violations result in hearings after the trial which the juror alleged to have engaged in those conversations must testify about his or her conduct. In some cases, the verdict has been set aside and a new trial ordered because of juror misconduct. So it is very important to abide by the rules. If someone tries to talk to you about the case, please report it to the clerk immediately. If you see or hear anything of a prejudicial nature or anything that you believe may compromise the proper conduct of the trial, please report that to the clerk immediately. These communications with the clerk should be in writing. Do not discuss the matters with your fellow jurors. Uh, if you decide to, you may take notes during the trial. You are never required to take notes. Even if a fellow juror is taking notes, you do not have to take notes. Notes are a good tool to help you refresh your recollection, but sometimes your notes about some of the evidence may not always match your actual recollection of the evidence. <clears throat> if there's a conflict between your notes and what you actually remember, it is your uh, recollection, rather, that must prevail. If there is a conflict between a, a fellow juror's notes and your recollection, your recollection must prevail. Remember, please, that your notes are not evidence. Your verdict will be based on the evidence and the law given. And if you would like testimony played back, you may request the court to have testimony played back. There's no need to try to write down everything. And your note taking should not distract you from focusing on the witness. The credibility that you ascribe to a witness is critical. So note taking should not interfere with your ability to view the witness as he or she is testifying, to listen to the witness, and evaluate the witness's testimony. What the witness is saying and how the witness says it is critical to your evaluation of the testimony and what weight you will give to that testimony. Now the notepads that will be given to you will be collected at the end of each trial day and kept secure and confidential. No one is permitted to look at your notes. 
you will not be allowed to make or modify your notes outside of court. And you are not allowed to compare notes with fellow jurors during the trial. Once deliberations again, you may discuss your notes. Now, the amount of notes that you take should not influence your personal recollection. Now, during the trial, the court will also take notes. Do not be influenced by the court's note taking. Realistically, you cannot know what the court is writing. If you desire to have a portion of the testimony read back, once your deliberations have begun, do not hesitate to request that. Please, again, do not look up anything on the internet concerning information about the case or any of the people involved, including the defendant, the witnesses, the lawyers, or the court. Please do not use internet maps or Google Earth or any other program or device to search for or view any place discussed during the course of the trial. Now we conclude with the lawyers having informed the court that the evidentiary portion of the trial will take about six weeks. This is an estimate. We don't intend to well, we should say it is unlikely the case will go as far as March 1st. The court will attempt to keep you informed of changes in the schedule. Once the evidentiary portion is over and the court directs you to deliberate, the length of the deliberations will be up to you. Again, we start every day at 10 o'clock. We take our break around 11.15, come back in, and then take our lunch break at 1 o'clock from 1 to 2, lunch break. 2 o'clock to 3.15, evidentiary portion of the trial, and then we conclude at 4.45. If you wish to communicate with the court during the trial, please uh, send it out in the form of a note. The note will be read to the parties and made a part of the record. If you have a question, please write it down and give it to the marshal who will bring it to the court. Now it's about 11.15. The court has concluded its comments. We'll take our morning recess, and we're going to resume at 11.30, and that's when the evidentiary portion of the trial will start. So we'll stand in our recess.
This honorable city court is now open and back to session. Please be seated. Thank you. I'll bring the jury in. Stayed ready to proceed. I am, Your Honor. You may call your first witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state will call Sergeant Aaron Latourette. your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm as the case may be that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God or upon penalty of perjury? I do. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Uh, Lieutenant Aaron Latourette, spelled A-A-R-O-N, Latourette, L-A-T-O-U-R-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. And your affiliation? I'm a lieutenant at the McCain Police Department. Thank you. May be seated. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. May, I May inquire, inquire Counsel. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Lieutenant Latourette, how are you? I'm, I'm good. Hi. Uh, Lieutenant, uh, can you please, uh, I have introduced you as Sergeant, sir. Can you please tell your rank? How long have you been a Lieutenant? And a little bit about yourself, please. Yes. Uh, I'm a Lieutenant at the New Canaan Police Department. I've been employed there for 23 years, two months. Um, during my time at the Police Department, uh, I've had several schools or training in regards to motor vehicle law, criminal law, um, leadership, supervision, investigations. Um, I've had several collateral duties while at the police department. Those collateral duties included uh, dispatcher, firearms instructor, motorcycle patrol, special response team. I'm currently the team leader for the special response team. Um, throughout my career at the New Canaan Police Department, I have been uh, assigned to the patrol division. In 2015, I was promoted to the rank of sergeant. And this past year, in 2023, I was promoted to the rank of uh, lieutenant. Are you in a particular division or department of the New Canaan Police Department? The patrol division, yes. Previous to that, you indicated you were a sergeant? I was, yes. Were you in, or assigned, I should say, to a particular division or department as a sergeant? Uh, 311 shift, yes. Uh, what is that? Uh, the New Canaan Police Department has three different shifts. It's day shift, we work eight hours. Uh, day shift, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. <laughs> Evening shift, 3 p.m. to 11 p.m., and the night shift, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. I was a sergeant on the 3 to 11 shift. Attorney Manning, if you could just instruct the witness that there is an interpreter, and it's fairly difficult to keep up with certain paces. So if the if witness we can. can talk a little bit more slowly. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, you are, as a, well, Actually, let me bring that back. Uh, were you working as a sergeant then in 2019? I was, yes. Is a position as a sergeant, are you in uniform? On the patrol division, yes. I was on shift, I was in uniform. Okay. It, with respect to uh, May, well, May 24th, 2019, uh, drawing your attention to that day in particular, what shift were you working? The evening shift, 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. And again, in uniform? In uniform, yes. Does that uni uniform also include a body cam? It does. Uh, however, that day in question, uh, body cameras are still new, fairly new to the New Canaan Police Department. Um, we had a limited number of cameras that were shared amongst all the patrol officers on the, on the, 
patrol division. Um, one was not available for me to wear that day, that shift. Uh, either was either charging a battery or downloading the information that was on the camera. Um, so that particular day, I was not wearing a body cam. Did you work with any other officers that day? Yes. A any other officers that had a body cam on? Yes, uh, Officer Matt Blank. He was uh, working 311 shift with me. He was wearing a body cam. Now, did you have occasion to respond to 69 Wells in New Can Wells Lane, I should say, in New Canaan that night? Yes. Why did you respond there? Uh, the police department had a report, a uh, complaint of a missing person at that address. Who was a missing person? Uh, Jennifer Dulos. Where were you when you heard the report of the missing person? Uh, I was in the police department. Um, I walked up to the dispatch center. Uh, Officer Kelly Coughlin was on the phone with a caller or a complainant. Um, it was uh, the babysitter for Jennifer Dulos. And Officer Coughlin kind of alerted my attention and said, hey, why don't you listen in? She put the, uh, the phone on speaker. If based on what you heard from that call, what did you do? Uh, the caller stated that Jennifer did not. Uh, Objection, hearsay. Well, the question was what, just, and it's non-responsive. If I may, Your Honor. It's not offered for the truth of the matter, Your Honor. It, my question was, based on the call, what did you do? It's offered to show what next steps were in his investigation. Well, the objection was hearsay. The objection is overruled. You can answer, sir. Uh, the caller stated that Jennifer did not uh, go to a doctor's appointment in New York City and that she was missing. And given the information, that, uh, Kelly Coughlin, our dispatcher, got at that time. Uh, Matt Blank, Officer Matthew Blank, and myself responded to 69 Wells Lane to check that property to see if we could find Jennifer. What type of area is 69 Wells Lane? It's a residential area, and that street is a dead end cul de sac. Do you recall around what time you went there? Uh, approximately 7 p.m. Your Honor, State has offered States 1. Uh, and just for the record, if I can, I have, I intend to show photographs with respect to witnesses. I have put them on a disc and shown copies to counsel. I am offering that uh, to play States 1 at this time. I don't believe that there's an objection. No, no objection. I just want to make sure we're talking about the same. There's all these discs. So if I could just for a moment converse with counsel. No objection. States 1 will be admitted as a full exhibit. Thank you. And Your Honor, if I may, it is associated with a States 1A. 1A contains a one page, uh, I guess, screenshot of each of the photographs that the state intends to introduce to keep track of what is contained on one, on States 1. So if I may. Lieutenant Latourette, if I can please draw your attention to the screen behind you. Give it one moment. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? I do, yes. What is it? Uh, it is an uh, overhead camera view of uh, 69 Wells Lane in New Canaan. Your Honor, may I ask uh, Lieutenant Latourette to approach the screen yes. and ask? ask some questions at that point. Thank you, sir, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Now, you indicated you responded to 69 Wells. Is 69 Wells Lane uh, depicted in that photograph? Yes. Could you please point to it? It's this residence here. The end of the cul-de-sac is here, and the driveway comes up to the residence, which is here. And for the record, I believe uh, you're pointing to the middle bottom of the center, I guess? on the screen, is yes. that correct? this residence. Thank you. Now, with respect to, you indicated it's a cul-de-sac, does it go out to a, a road? Could you point to where the road is, please? Uh, this is Wells Lane. It does travel this direction, and Frogtown Road is out here. You may have a seat, sir. Thank you. Now, when you arrived at 69 Wells Lane, was it dark out? No, not yet. Okay. How would you describe it? Uh, daylight, you can see. Okay. 
Were you looking for anything in particular? Uh, we are looking for Jennifer Dulos, the missing person. And what did you do? Uh, Officer Blank and myself uh, went to the front door. Uh, we rang the doorbell, we knocked on the door, and there was no answer. And again, I'm going to refer you to the screen behind you, sir. And if you can take a look, this, if you can, please, uh, do you recognize what's depicted on that screen? Yes. Could you please describe what that is? Uh, that is a view of 69 Wells Lane from the bottom of the driveway, uh, looking up the driveway at the residence. And is that uh, what Wells Lane looked like that night when you responded? Yes. Now, you indicated it wasn't dark, or it was still light you could see. Is that the time of day? Depicted yes. Accurately? Uh, if I can, just on the top screen, it does, for the record, Your Honor, this is, it indicates 1-101. So it's essentially the first picture on States 1, just for ID purposes. Um, I'm going to show you, sir, what's marked on the top corner as 2. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Yes, the front of the residence at 69 Wells Lane. Now, was, you indicated you knocked on some doors. Is the door that you knocked on it contained in that photograph? It is, yes. If you wouldn't mind, if you could just stand up and point, please. Thank you. This is the front door of the residence. Okay. Did you go up to the front door of the residence that day? We did, yes. Okay. Were there any lights on on the property? Uh, I don't remember. Okay. If you can't, just have a seat, sir. Thank you. Now, did anybody answer? Uh, there was no answer at the residence. Now, it states three. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. It states one, picture three. If you can uh, look behind you again, sir. What does that depict? It's a, a picture of the front of the residence. Okay. Is this more of a, I guess, is the same door that was on the previous picture depicted yes. in this? Yes. Okay. If you can, just point it out briefly. This is the, uh, the front door of the residence at 69 Wells Lane. Thank you. For the record, that's on the lower left-hand portion. And states one, picture four. Um, what does this also depict? That is a view of the front of the house. It uh, appears to be the side of the garage. Okay. Um, the right-hand side of that picture will be the driveway and the uh, garage doors. Which states one, picture five. Uh, if you can, just take a look and indicate what that shows. Uh, that is the driveway leading to the residence, and it depicts the uh, the garage door area of that residence. When you arrived that day after you knocked on doors, did you go anywhere else on the property or anywhere depicted in these photographs? Yes. Uh, Officer Blank and I did walk uh, the perimeter of the residence to see if uh, we could see anybody inside, to see if any looked like anybody was home. We then returned to the driveway where the garage doors were. And uh, we were provided a code to the garage door by the, uh, the complainant, the babysitter. Uh, and we used that code to enter the garage. OK. I'm going to walk through, ask you a couple questions about that if I can. Uh, but first, if you can, states one, picture six, if you can take a look behind you. What does that show, sir? That shows the, uh, the rear of the residence at 69 Wells Lane. And by the way, this is obviously more light. Is this photograph taken that night? It was not, no. OK, but does it fairly and accurately depict where you went that night? Yes. Are there doors on the back side of the house, please? There is, yes. Well, where are they? If you wouldn't mind taking them, getting up and pointing to them, please. There's a door here, and there's a bunch of doors here. OK, thank you. You can have a seat. Sir, did you knock on those doors? Uh, we did not. Uh, we simply walked around the perimeter of the residence, looked inside to see if those doors were unlocked. They were secure, locked. Did you touch any of the doorknobs? We did, yes. Okay. In the course of touching the doorknobs, did you wear gloves? We were not wearing gloves, no. Now, you indicated also that you went back to the garage area. Did you attempt to get in through the garage? We did. How did you do that? Uh, we were provided a garage code uh, from the babysitter. Uh, Officer Coughlin provided garage code to Officer Blank and myself. We entered that garage code into the keypad, and the garage door opened. Sir, states one, picture seven. If you can take a look behind you, please. Thank you. Do you, uh, what is depicted on that photograph, please? 
That is a picture of the garage. It was a three-car garage. In the center bay of that garage was a black SUV. Um, and it also depicts the keypad that we used to open that garage door. Did the other garage bays have keypads, keypad access? They did not, no. Now, as you entered the garage, what did you see? Uh, the black SUV uh, pictured, and it had a New York registration plate. Did you do anything next, I guess? Yes. Uh, Officer Blank uh, called over the radio to our dispatcher, that registration, New York registration plate, to see who the registered owner was and see, you know, who, who owned that vehicle and why it was there. Why did you do that? Uh, an attempt to try to figure out where the missing person was. Did you enter the garage? We did. And could you, do you describe the inside of the garage for us, please? Uh, the left garage bay was empty. The right garage bay was empty. Uh, a black SUV pictured was in the center garage bay. Um, in front of this vehicle, in the middle of the garage, there was a door that led from the garage into the residence. Is that door depicted on that photograph? It is, yes. If you can, can you just... This is the door leading from the garage to the residence. Thank you. And for the record, pointing to, I would say, the center of the photograph. Thank you. Sir, did you notice anything in the garage uh, that drew your attention? Uh, Officer Blank and myself entered the garage. We walked to the left of that SUV, the driver's side of that vehicle. We walked to the front of that vehicle. Uh, I checked the doorknob from the garage, leading from the garage into the residence. The doorknob was unlocked. We waited in front of that vehicle at the door until the dispatcher got back that registration information to us. While we waited, uh, I looked at the vehicle and noticed that there was a what appeared to be red blood on the front of that vehicle. Can you please describe what you saw? Uh, a red mark on the grill area of the vehicle. Um, and again, it drew my attention because it didn't match the color of the grill, didn't match the color of the vehicle. Was there any damage to the vehicle? No, we did not. We looked at the vehicle, uh, did not observe any damage. Initially, Officer Blank and myself discussed it possibly could be a deer strike uh, in the roadway. And again, there was no hair, there was no damage indicating uh, any such um, collision with a deer. Now, Officer Blank was with you during this time period? Yes. And was it your testimony that Officer Blank had a body cam on? Yes. If I can, Your Honor, the state's intention is to offer at this time states two, which I don't believe there's any objection. If I can just confer with counsel. I believe there's no objection, no Your objection. Honor. States two admitted as a full exhibit. Thank you. <coughs> Sir, I'm going to draw your attention just briefly, if I can, to the screen behind you and then uh, ask you a question if I can. Do you recognize, sir, what's depicted on that photograph? Or I'm sorry, on that screen? It appears to be body camera footage. Is that the body camera footage from May 24, 2019? Yes. And is that actually yourself on the screen? It is, yes. Okay. Your Honor, the state's intention is to just play it through. I believe it is about 20 minutes. Sir, if you can direct your attention to the screen while we play it. Thank you.
Extra there. Yeah. 
No. It's an iPod, but it doesn't make it anything. No, no, it looks like this is. Can you check that one? Yeah.
picture of that one that was hanging there. I got a flash right back right there. You know what I, I this has got to be a dated picture though. That's got to be a really dated picture. So the picture's in the boys' room. Probably. some point but dry first dry edges what's her yeah well he just called in he had a lot of scuff on there's some back here too is there yeah down here too strange Take pictures, I'll call the altitude. Hmm. Headquarters to 13 or 70. 13. Well, Can I have one of you the units break? Uh, staff three located the vehicle on lap of Scraped or scratched all down through the driver's side. Uh, 
Oh, all right. Well, well, we'll, we'll, we're taking pictures and then we'll be out of here. Good enough. And then we'll meet up with the uh, captain on Lapham. Roger that. Thank you, sir. Oh, thanks. Bye. Okay. Well, it's a strange in connection with the fact that we've got a missing person or potentially a missing person. You know? And, uh, Yeah, there's scrapes on this side too, but there's no blood near them, so whatever they hit went down this side of the vehicle. Splat it all. Yeah. It's hard to get a picture of because the flash on this thing isn't working, I guess. He said it's unoccupied. There's some in the tire, too. Um, if you like, I can request the dog to do a track. I have uh, 13 and 7. All over there. Yeah. Yeah. I'll leave that at their discretion. It's all blood. All right. 13 at headquarters. I'm going to see if we can get a K9. And uh, before we leave here, if you want to hang out. Her jacket's in her purse. Uh, as long as you can make access, you'll be able to track right off the driver's seat. Let's grab that key. Yep, that's a good idea. I thought he said he came back to a, a mini cooper. Uh, that's a fun We're grabbing the key. The residence is clear. We'll be in route with Rafa. Received. I'll uh, go to the hotline so we can locate a camera. Alright. The car's pretty. Yeah, it doesn't sit well with me. Especially because, like, the, it's like a pattern here. You know what I mean? It's clothing. Right. Not. Fur, but there, it's, I mean, it's up here too. It's hard to get any of this. These cameras are, we should get better cameras. Hopefully, this is getting it though. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Usually, if you hit a deer and there's blood in your car, you take it to the car wash and get it cleaned. Especially a Range Rover. Scrapes there. Let's see if there's any damage in I mean, this is grandma's car, so you never know. But, scripts there. Okay. You get your camera out, get your light out of here. I'm washing my pictures out. All right. questions if I can based on what we just saw. So when an individual wears a body camera, where do they normally wear it? Uh, on the center of their body to project uh, what kind of the, the officer would see. It, throughout the course of your walking through 69 Wells, uh, did you look into closets and other, uh, I guess, cubby holes, if you will? Yes, we, we checked the residence for anywhere we believed a person could be. And there was also a uh, photograph taken of a picture of the children on the wall. Uh, do you recall that on the video? Yes. Uh, why was that photograph taken? Uh, just to see if we could, uh, who lived at the residence, any po possible re um, occupants of the residence, and to see if that might help us in identifying or locating a missing person. 
While you were conducting the search of 69 Wells, did you wear gloves? Did not, no. Did Officer Blanks wear, wear gloves? No. Now, there was also a uh, point in the video in States 2 that there was a purse in the, in the kitchen. Do you recall that? Yes. Uh, Officer Coughlin had relayed to Officer Blank and myself that uh, there was a Jennifer's purse was between the mudroom and the kitchen. And normally, if she was not home. Objection, hearsay. Well, the response was the purse was between the mudroom and the kitchen. And then the court does not know what was coming next. Well, my question for the court's uh, knowledge, my next question was going to be, why did you go through the purse? That's irrelevant. Well, overruled. You can answer, sir. So the, uh, the babysitter, Lauren, had told Officer Coughlin that the, uh, the purse would normally not be at the residence if Jennifer was not at the residence. So we looked at the, uh, the purse to see if we could find any information as to where Jennifer might be. And we noticed that the, on top of the purse, there was a spring light type jacket. And inside, we noticed a, a notepad that Officer Blank looked at. And we also noticed there was a key fob uh, or a set of keys for a Chevy vehicle. With respect to that Chevy vehicle, did you, well, withdraw that if I can. Uh, did you do anything with those keys? Yes, those keys were taking, taken from 69 Wells Lane, and we ultimately took them to Lapham Road, where the Chevy was located by Captain Walsh. Where is Lapham Road? Lapham Road is in the southwestern area of New Canaan, and it uh, borders Waveney Park. What is Waveney Park? Uh, Waveney Park is a large uh, acreage area in New Canaan. Um, it is a public park that it's open to the community and it has several walking trails, has a dog park, has a swimming pool, has uh, playing fields. So it's a, a community park. If I can, I'm going to show you and direct your attention back to the screen behind you. The state is returning to states one. Play based on it. The kids dates one uh, picture marked eleven. Do you recognize what's depicted on that photograph, sir? Yes, it's an aerial photo of a uh, portion of Waveney Park. It also includes Lapham Road. Would you mind, sir, uh, getting up if it's okay with the court? If I can have him stand up and just uh, answer a few questions about that screen. If you can't please identify Lapham Road if it's on on that photograph. The Lapham Road runs here. And there is another road, I'm sorry, just for the record, uh, that was, I guess, well, let me ask this, is that north or south? Uh, or? The way I orient Lapham Road in regards to this map is it runs north and south. And this road here is the Merritt Parkway I call, uh, in the portion of New Canaan, uh, Merritt Parkway runs easterly. Okay, so. Uh, for the record, for Lapham Road North to South would be in the middle of States 1, picture 11, and the Merritt Parkway, could you point to the bottom, I guess, left to right? Is that correct, sir? Yes, this is Waveney, or I'm sorry, this is uh, the Merritt Parkway. Okay. Is Waveney Park depicted on that photograph? Yes, the uh, area of Waveney Park is this area here, uh, the open fields and wooded area, and the property also crosses Lapham Road over in here. This area here is a mulch pile. Um, the town of New Canaan Public Works collects leaves and they mulch them in this area here. And just for the record, the um, Waveney Park would be on the, I guess if you're looking at the right side of the photograph and the mulch pile, I guess in the middle, is that correct, sir? Yes, this is the mulch pile. Right side of the photograph is Waveney Park. Thank you. Is there an entrance onto or into Waveney Park from Lapham Road? Yes. Where is that? Uh, as you look at the picture, the entrance to Waveney Park is going to be here. We can see the uh, roadway going up through the park. You say roadway, is that for vehicles? It is, yes. Is there any entrance to Waveney Park off of La Lapham Road that is for pedestrians? Uh, yes, there's hiking trails all throughout the wooded area surrounding the park. Along the Lapham Road, there is a pull-offs on the dirt area uh, alongside Lapham Road, both, both sides of the roadway. By pull-offs, what do you mean? Uh, it's an area on the shoulder of the road. Uh, it's just dirt where vehicles are parked. 
and uh, it's, it allows a vehicle to park fully off the travel portion of Lapham Road. And where are there cutoffs, if you will, or pullouts uh, off of Lapham Road? On are they depicted on that photograph? Uh, you can't really see them due to the wooded area. However, they're going to be north of the Merritt Parkway. So between the mulch pile and the Merritt Parkway, this portion here will we'll, we'll be where all those pull-offs are and uh, vehicles can park. Let me see if I could. If I can, Your Honor, I am zooming in. To write uh, the uh, mulch pile, is that on the upper middle to the left? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Are, can you see the, I guess, some of the cutoffs on that? It, it is okay. hard to see because of the tree line uh, and the vegetation. However, um, some of these open areas in the vegetation would be some of the pull-offs. And again, they're both sides of the roadway, both sides of Lapham Road. Did you go to Lapham Road that day? Yes. Is where you, well, where did you go? Uh, we went to this area here on the uh, southern shoulder of Lapham Road. Why did you go there? Uh, Captain Walsh located the black Chevy Suburban uh, that Jennifer Dulos drives. Did you bring anything with you? Yes, the, uh, a, a Chevy key fob out of a purse located at 69 Wells Lane. Uh, you could have a seat, sir, if I can. States 1, picture 12. Sir, if you could take a look behind you. Depicted in that photograph? Yes. What is it? That is the area of Lapham Road that I just described, uh, the pull off parking spaces. Um, that is the southbound shoulder. Okay. When you say southbound shoulder, is that the, if you, are, well, could you just explain that with direction of the Merritt Parkway? Uh, perhaps if you can stand up again, I'm sorry, but show where would the direction of the Merritt Parkway be in relation to this photograph? So the, the black Chevy Suburban, that, Suburban in this picture is pointing in the direction of the Merritt Parkway. So as the Lapham Road travels towards the Merritt Parkway, a Chevy Suburban is parked on the right-hand side of the road. Did the vehicle look like that when you arrived that night? Yes. However, TV just went. If I may just have a moment, Your Honor, the yep. TV. There you go. All right. All right, sir. Uh, when you arrived, it was Officer Blank with you? Uh, we had different patrol vehicles, but we both traveled from 69 Wells Lane to Lapham Road. Is there another cutout or pullout depicted on that photograph? Yes. Uh, could you point to it, please? Yes. This area here, these are the pull-offs. That's the center middle of the photograph? Yes. Is there another one on the other side, like towards the Merritt Parkway side? There is, yes. Okay. How many cutoffs are on that side of the road? I, I believe three or four. Which, if there are three or four, do you recall how many were, be, were behind, I guess, facing north of the, of the Chevy, and how many were in front going towards the Merritt Parkway? Uh, one behind and at least one in front of. Okay. All right. You can have a seat, sir. I'm sorry. And just briefly, uh, States 1, picture 11. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that, please? It is a black Chevy Suburban. Now, did you, uh, what did you do when you got to Lapham Road? Oh, we were looking for a missing person, Jennifer Dulos. Officer Blank and myself uh, checked the trail that runs parallel to the Merritt Parkway. We walked uh, look on the trail looking for anything that would lead us to the missing person. Okay, when you say Parallel to the Merritt Parkway. If I can go back to the here, 
States 1, picture 11. Uh, is the area that you walk depicted in that photograph? Yes. Could you please just point to it? Sure. <clears throat> so the suburban was found in this area on a pull off. Officer Blank and myself walked on a trail parallel to the parkway in this area. Why'd you go there? Uh, looking for any uh, indications of a missing person. Did you take note of anything in your walk? No. What did you do after you did that? Uh, FC, so, so. A police officer from Wilton Police Department uh, arrived on scene, a canine officer. Officer Blank and I returned to Lapham Road where the Suburban was located. What did you do next, if anything? Uh, officer Blank assisted uh, the canine officer. I stayed with the vehicle and Captain Walsh on Lapham Road. At some point, did you return to 69 Wells? Yes. Did you go into Waveney Park, by the way, at any point besides that walk on um, that you just described? No. Okay. When did you return to 69 Wells? Uh, after the canine conducted a search in the area of Lapham Road in Waveney Park, um, no track was uh, able to be established. So I was instructed to go to, from Lapham Road with a canine handler back to Wells Lane to see if we could do a search from that location. Did you follow the canine into Waveney Park or anything like that? No. Okay. So when you returned to 269 Wells, did you return with Officer Blank? No. And what did you do when you returned to 69 Wells? As myself and the canine handler from Wilton Police Department arrived at 69 Wells. I used that code that was provided to open that garage door, and we entered the garage. Uh, the canine handler stated he needed a scent item in order to conduct a search for the missing person, Jennifer Dulos. Uh, I knew there was a spring jacket located on top of the purse, so we went to that location, grabbed that spring jacket. What did you do with the jacket? Uh, the canine handler, handler placed it in the, uh, the middle of the driveway uh, for his canine to get a scent. Now, did the canine conduct a search? Uh, it, it did. Okay, did you have any, play any role in connection with that search? No, I stayed in the driveway. What did you do? Uh, well, strike that. Did you go inside the garage again? Yes. It, did you make any further observations in the garage? Yes. Well, what did you observe? When we entered the garage, we went on the right side of the vehicle, uh, the black SUV or Range Rover. Uh, on the right passenger side of the vehicle, on the floor, I observed what appeared to be a footprint, uh, a red, reddish in color, could have been a footprint of blood. States one, photograph nine. Sorry, I'm gonna have you take a look behind you again. You can. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Yes. Here, I'm gonna scroll in. What is that? It appears to be a toe portion of a footprint. And it... Is that what you observed in the garage that night? Yes. Did you make any other observations? Yes, uh, to the right. Uh, side of that garage, as you enter the garage door, uh, there was garbage cans. Uh, on the exterior of the garbage can near the lid, there appeared to be a red color that appeared to be blood. And anything else? Uh, not that I can re recall at this time. Uh, I'm going to show you two more photographs if I can, sir. If you could take a look behind you, uh, states one, photograph eight. Uh, do you recognize what's depicted in that? Yes, appears to be drops on the rear portion, the rear left or driver's side of that vehicle, drops on the uh, concrete floor. Okay. And one more, please, states 10. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, states one, photograph 10. Uh, do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Uh, yes, it appears to be an area of the concrete floor uh, that appears to be smeared, uh, pinkish, reddish in color, as if something was cleaned up. Did you, after making these observations, did you convey them to anybody? Yes, I notified the shift commander, Lieutenant Ogrens, and Captain Walsh, who was still in Lapham Road with the uh, Chevy Suburban. What did you do uh, next, if anything? Uh, Detective Officer Patton uh, arrived at 69 Wells Lane. It was determined that that location was going to be a crime scene, and the shift commander notified the uh, state police. Why the state police? Uh, their crime crime investigations. Okay. Uh, may I ask, uh, does New Canaan have a crime scene unit? 
Uh, we have a, an investigative unit, um, but we don't have uh, the capabilities that the state police has. In what way? Uh, limited resources. Okay. And, uh, did the state police come out to 69 Wells that night? Yes. Uh, did you have any further, in, well, did you do anything else that night? Yes, uh, later on in the evening while still at 69 Wells Lane, I believe it was around 11.30 p.m., I conducted a neighborhood canvas, which means I go door to door, just seeing if I can find any information in regards to whatever the case is we're, we're investigating. Um, I did speak to a few neighbors. I was also looking for any cameras that residences might have, whether it's a ring camera by the door or security footage cameras is, uh, on any houses or residences. Did you download any video cameras or anything that night? No. Uh, now, at some point, did you get your fingerprints or palm prints? Uh, yes. I guess tested, is that the right word? Yes, a, uh, one of the state police investigators uh, from the crime uh, unit came out and they took palm prints, hand prints, fingerprints from, of me. Okay. And that was in connection of this case? Yes. Okay. Let me just have one moment, Your Honor. I have nothing further, thank you. Cross-examination. plug in my um, USB cord that it uh, switches, so if I may. Good afternoon, Lieutenant. My name is John Schoenhorn. I represent Michelle Traconis in this case. I just have a few questions. Um, the time that was on the video, uh, the video body camera that we watched, was that accurate? I don't remember what time uh, the video camera showed. Well, my notes said that it started at 17, looked like 1757. That would be about uh, 757 at night. Is that right? I'm sorry. Say that again. Let me rephrase the question. If it says at some point as we're watching it, 20, like 20 colon zero zero, would that be 8 o'clock p.m.? Yes. And to the best of your knowledge, were the uh, body cameras even back then synchronized so that they were at least close in time to the actual time that you were there? Yes. So is it fair to say that you were in that house at approximately 8 p.m. on uh, May 24th? Yes. And you said, I think you did say that it was still light out, correct? Yes. And you were not yourself wearing a body camera that night, is that right? I was not, no. Now I noticed in your uniform today, you have a box in the center of your uniform just below your, your body microphone. Is that where the body camera would have been on Officer Blank that night? Yes. So it's center of the body, sort of view of the person who is wearing it, correct? Correct. And of course, you've seen that video prior to just now, correct? Correct. As you went through the house, you looked at each and every room, right? Yes. You looked in closets, I think was the answer to one of the questions by the state, right? Yes. And in a couple of the places, there was some clothing on the floor, according to that video, correct? Yes. Did you go through any of the items of clothing at that point, other than the jacket you mentioned? No. <clears throat> you talked about a canine. Was this a tracking dog? Uh, I'd have to ask the Wilton uh, canine handler. Well, I was going to ask you, was there more than one dog that night that was sent to the either to uh, the house on Wells Lane or to the uh, Waveney Park? Yes, more canines were called to that area after the Wilton uh, Police Canine had left. You indicated that Officer Blank remained at that location, is that right? At the Waveney Park that night after he left? Yes. Do you know whether he accompanied any dog search, that is any canine uh, searching dog that night? He did assist the Wilton canine that I was assisting at Wells Lane. He did assist that canine handler at Lapham Road and Waveney Park. And just so that we're uh, differentiating between the two, do you recall that that was a canine 
and its canine handler from the town of Newtown? It was uh, Wilton Police Department. The one with you. What about the one at uh, Waveney Park? Uh, the, the initial one that initially responded uh, was a Wilton canine. All right. So the same one or a different one that went with you? Same one. All right. So I'm saying was there a separate canine dog and a handler that came there that night that you're aware of? Uh, there very well could have been. I don't remember at this time. Fair. That was going to be my question. Mm -hmm. So you did not observe Officer Blank accompanying a canine handler into the woods at Waveney Park, correct? I did, yes. You did? Yes. Was it the same dog that then went with you and its handler to uh, the house at 69 Wells Lane? Yes. In the parking lot, in the parking lot right outside of the garage, you recall, according to the uh, your images, that there was a basketball hoop there. Did you notice that? Yes. Was the basketball hoop facing the garage, or was it facing away from the garage? Facing the garage. You indicated that you took a key fob with you from the house. Is that right? Yes. Did you use that key fob to see if it connected to the suburban at Waveney Park? I did not, know. Who did you give that fob to? Uh, Officer Blank. Did you observe Officer Blank use that fob to open up the, or to attempt to open the uh, locked door on the suburban? I did not, know. Now if I could just go back for a moment to, there's the image, I believe, 11, states 11 on this exhibit. And I just want to clarify, if you would look behind you there, I'm not going to ask you to stand up, but this is the satellite image of Waveney Park. Is that correct? A, a portion of Waveney Park, yes. All right. And I want to clarify directions. You said that the Merritt Parkway heads basically east and west through the Canaan. Is that right? Generally, yes. All right. So would you just indicate whether east is to the right of this image or to the left of this image? Uh, east is to the, uh, is going to be, uh, rephrase the question, sir. Yeah, you're, you're, you're looking at an image on a screen. Mm -hmm. Is it on this side closest to the window and the jury, or is it closer to the judge where he's sitting compared to where you are? It's going to be closer to the window, closer to the jury, the right-hand okay. side of the picture. All right, and I'm just going to use my mouse for a, a section. You indicated, did you not, if you look at the screen, that you walked along a section of the park in a easterly, you said easterly, right? Yes. Easterly direction parallel to the Merritt Parkway. Is that right? Yes. The did you also go across Lapham in a westerly direction in this in this other direction here across I, I, on the other side? I did not. No. And so that we're also clear, was the the you're saying Lapham in this area generally is north south. Correct? Correct. Would the car, according to those pictures that we saw, in the Suburban, be on the, looking at this image, on the uh, left side of Lapham Road, looking down, or on the right side, from this map? The left side of Lapham Road, looking down. Right. And so we're clear for the record, you're talking about the side where you see the leaf piles, the mulch piles that we see uh, on that area, is that correct? Yes. Now, I just want to also orient um, uh, the park. Does Lap, does Waveney Park include any of the area to the to this area around the leaf mulch area? I don't know exactly where the property lines are. I know north of the leaf pile, there is a uh, Frisbee golf area that belongs to the park. And does the park continue and then stop at the bottom at the Merritt Parkway? The, that is the border of the park, the, the Merritt Parkway. And if I recall correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, this area along both sides of Lapham near the parkway is raised, it's elevated above the parkway. Is that correct? Uh, I don't recall. You don't recall that if you walked along in the park parallel to the parkway, you're looking down and you're seeing the roofs of cars as they drive by on the Merritt Parkway. It depends on the portion of the uh, the park. Uh, certain portions may be elevated, but a lot of portions would be parallel to or even to as you're walking on the trail. Well, I'm talking about the part where you were walking. That parallel to the road, even to the road. 
that side was even? Uh, portions of it, yes. All right, so does Lapham Road then uh, cross under the Merritt Parkway? Uh, Lapham Road goes over top. Over, so there isn't a big hill approaching the Merritt Parkway, is there? On Lapham Road? On Lapham Road. No. So in order for it to go straight across Lapham Road, it has to be elevated above the parkway, right? In certain portions, yes. Well, I'm talking about where Lapham Road crosses the Merritt Parkway. Where Lapham Road crosses the parkway, there is a drop down to the parkway. All right. And is that also true if you go in the other direction, uh, on the other side of Lapham Road? What was the question, sir? Yeah, isn't it also raised up at that point? Uh, the wooded area or the road, oh, sir? The wooded area. The wooded area depends on where you are in that wooded area, sir. How long, how about parallel to the Merritt Parkway? Isn't that elevated well above the Merritt Parkway? I don't recall at this time. Fair enough. So in any event, this area, according to at least this map, has a lot of trees. Is that a fair statement? Uh, certain portions of the park, yes. As depicted in the picture, there is a, a wide open field as well. Well, the, the field, I didn't ask you about the field. That's yep. up, as you can see, sort of across from where the mulch field is, correct? You're referring to this area that's in a different color, sort of a lighter green and yellow, yellowish green lawn, right? Yes. So I'm talking about the forested area. Okay. These are mature trees in that area, isn't that true? Yes. We're talking about really tall trees with large trunks, correct? Uh, most of them. And you can walk through that area without uh, falling over uh, a bunch of little branches and, and uh, small bushes, correct? The, the trails are maintained. Uh, if you're off the trail, there's going to be bushes and shrubbery. And if you go the park to the, if you continue in a, um, in a um, westerly direction, the park is also bordered by something that we see in this picture, correct? This line here. See that? Yes, sir. What is that? That is the uh, Metro North Railroad. Right. So there are, there was an, in 2019, there was an active Metro North Railroad uh, line that paralleled the western portion of the park, correct? Yes. And uh, right here, by the, the base of, the, uh, there's a, where there's a, the train crosses the Merritt Parkway, that's also an elevated railroad crossing, correct? Uh, I'm not familiar with that crossing of the parkway, sir. Fair enough, but right below that is a train station, is it not? Uh, yes. Right, that's the Talmadge Hill Metro North Station, correct? Yes. It's a commuter rail station, right? Yes. Let me just ask you a little bit about Lapham Road. Lapham Road, I noticed, we can go back to some of those pictures that we just uh, looked at. I think number 12. There's a double, this is I guess 11. There's a double yellow line, is there not, on Lapham Road in this area? Yes. So Lapham Road, at least in this area, is a major thoroughfare in the town of New Canaan. Is that true? It depends on your definition of a major thoroughfare. All right. Well, we're not talking about the Merritt Parkway. So mm -hmm. I'm asking, is it a well-traveled road? Y yes. So it's not a remote part of town where only local residents would use, right? Right. You've done, have you ever done traffic enforcement on Lapham Road? I have. Sometimes the, the traffic on a weekday is very heavy, isn't it? It depends on the time of day. Sure. People use the park. This is a main access to get to the Waveney Park entrance, isn't it? It is one of the entrances to the park. And there is traffic, from your experience, back in 2019 and before, throughout the day at least, correct? Objection. Well, there was traffic back and forth throughout the day on the date in question. What's the objection? Relevance. Overruled. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Back in 2019, that there was a well-traveled road that during the day there would be a fair amount of traffic uh, traveling back and forth on Waveney Road, including accessing the park, correct? Again, it depends on what your interpretation or definition of fair amount of traffic is. I don't have any traffic statistics, but it was a, a, a traveled road by a, a vehicles, yes. As opposed to a remote part of New Canaan, which there also is, correct? Yes.
by the, these pictures that we're looking at, including Exhibit 11, uh, were these, do you know, taken that evening after, the, after you arrived at the scene? The picture on the screen, sir? Would you, if you look at the screen, please. Uh, I don't know if that picture was taken that night, because by the time I arrived in Lapham Road, it would have been dark. That's or dark. my question. This yes. picture appears to have been taken uh, at least during somewhat daylight hours, correct? It appears that way, yes. Un unless somebody adjusted the lighting, but it appears not to have been taken at the time of your arrival, correct? Correct. But is that the exact position you found the vehicle parked in that turn turnout on Lapham Road? It appears to be, yes. By the way, when you arrived, the um, garage, was it open or closed at that residence at 69 Wells Lane? The garage, all three bays of the garage were closed. And you said, you testified that someone gave you the code so you could open it, is that right? Yes. And you opened the middle bay, is that correct? Yes. And when you first walked in, you walked to the right of the vehicle, correct? No. You walked to the left of the vehicle? Correct. And when you first walked in, you, nothing stood out to you immediately as being out of the ordinary. Is that correct? When you first went in? Uh, when I first entered the garage, no. And then you went through the house. Nothing stood out to you as being uh, out of place, except maybe the fact that you saw a purse on the floor, right? Correct. I have no further questions. Thank you. Is there a redirect? One moment. Nothing. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Lieutenant, you may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, if, if I can, Your Honor, call my next witness as well. Uh, Scott Romano. If I may just approach the clerk, Your Honor. If you could please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm as the case may be that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God or upon penalty of perjury? Yes, I do. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Scott Romano, R-O-M-A-N-O. And your affiliation? Uh, retired sergeant from the Canaan Police Department. Thank you. And you may be seated. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. May I inquire, Your Honor? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Romano, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Uh, so you are retired from the New Canaan Police Department? Correct. When did you retire? June of 2023. And what rank were you when you retired? Sergeant in the investigation section. How long were you a sergeant in the investigation session? Five years. Could you just uh, describe briefly, um, well, I'll start with this. Could you please describe some of your training and experience as a New Canaan police officer and then sergeant? Sure. Uh, after graduating the police academy, I was assigned to the patrol division. During my time there, uh, I functioned as a motor officer, uh, a field training officer, an instructor. 
an accident reconstructionist uh, with a couple additional duties, and then after being promoted, I did patrol for a short time and was then assigned to the investigation section. What kind of crimes does the investigative section investigate, I guess? Everything from uh, bad checks or simple frauds to stolen vehicles to murders. Does New Canaan have a, I guess, crime scene unit? Not specifically, no. Now, I'm going to draw your attention to May of 2019, specifically May 24, 2019. Were you working that day? I was not working that day. Did you have occasion to respond to the New Canaan Police Department? I did. I was contacted by the on-duty um, detective who requested assistance with a missing persons case. Who was the on-duty detective? Detective Tom Patton. And the missing person? Jennifer Dulos. About what time or how did you get contacted? I was contacted uh, by phone at approximately 9 p.m. Uh, Detective Patton explained very briefly what he had been called on and asked me to come in and assist him as we started the investigation. Where did you go? Initially, I went to the police department to grab some equipment, and then I responded to Lapham Road outside of Waveney Park, where Jennifer's vehicle had been located. Were you alone? Yes, I was. Now, did you respond uh, in uniform? No, I was in plain clothes. Where on Lapham Road did you respond to? So the vehicle was located just south of the back entrance to Waveney Park on the southbound shoulder of Lapham Road. When you arrived, was anybody else on scene? Uh, Officer Blank from the patrol division was there with the vehicle. And could you just briefly explain what Waveney Park is, please? Uh, it's approximately a 250 acre park located on the south side or south edge of New Canaan that's used for different passive recreation. May I just have one moment with counsel, Your Honor? Yes. All right, sir, I'm going to draw your attention to the screen behind you. States 4. Um. Uh, states 4, this is uh, designated as picture 12 on the upper left corner, just for the record, Your Honor. Sir, do you recognize what is depicted in that photograph? Yes. What is it? That was Jennifer Dulos's vehicle. When did you, um, what did you do when you arrived on scene? I was briefed, brief, um, briefed quickly by Officer Blank, and then I effectively took over securing that vehicle and making sure nobody had any contact with it until we decided further what was going to need to be done with it. How did you do that? By physically staying next to the vehicle during the course of the overnight. Um, I did a preliminary walk around to make sure I understood what was there and what wasn't there, and then basically just secured it so it was not touched. Could you the car, please? It was a black Chevy Suburb depicted. Um, there was nothing initially remarkable, although looking at the passenger side, which the side that's against the wood line, it was, uh, I noted at my initial walk around with a flashlight that it appeared that something had been wiped on the side of the vehicle. There were uh, streaks in it and some marks that looked, although dirt may have been brushed off it without being washed first, there were scratches. And some small amounts of what looked like, from my experience, to be a blood-like substance in different locations on the lower part of the vehicle. Uh, I'm going to show you, sir, if you can, states four, picture what's marked as 11. Wouldn't you? You uh, mentioned you did a walk around the vehicle. Well, I just check that. Uh, how close was the car parked to the wood line? It was up against the brush on the side of the road. So you really couldn't get into the passenger side of the vehicle without a little bit of effort. Did you attempt to get into the car? No, not at any point in time during the night. Now, you mentioned those marks on the side of the car. Are, were those marks on the side of the car that is depicted in this photograph? No, they were on the passenger side of the car that would be against the wood line. Where on the vehicle did you see those marks? 
uh, I believe it was the right passenger door and the lower section near the running board. Did you advise anybody of what you had found? I mentioned it to Detective Patton that I noticed it, and we just, at that point, kept note of it so that we could further look into that at a later time. By the way, do you know when these photographs were taken? I believe those were taken on the morning of the 25th. So from, uh, am I correct in saying you arrived at Lapham Road at 9 o'clock? Was that your testimony? It was actually probably closer to 10.30 by the time I drove from home to work and then got to Lapham Road. Uh, could we at least have an AM versus PM? That's not been established yet, but I, it seems it's obvious, but I would ask that there be clarification. Could you sure, was sure. So I was contacted at 9 p.m. On the, on the 24th, and I arrived on scene at approximately 10.30 p.m. Attorney Manning, before you proceed, you identified this in the packet as States 4. Was yes. States 4 admitted as a full exhibit? Yes, Your Honor. Without objection. She she may not have indicated, but she asked me, and I said I had no objection. Well, States 4 will be admitted as a full exhibit. The record has to be complete. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, and as I indicated, all the photographs are contained per witnesses, so that's why they are directed in that way. Um, so. Sir, you arrived on scene between 10.30 and uh, do you recall around what time this photograph was taken? Sometime after 7 a.m., but I don't recall exactly what time it was. Did you remain on scene the whole night? Yes, I did. Uh, who took the photograph? I believe that was Detective Matt Riley from the State Police. And did you observe him taking the photograph? I was present when he was taking the photos, yes. Okay. Now. At that time, um, when Detective Riley arrived on scene or on Lapham Road, uh, did anything happen to the car? So we eventually determined that to further investigate that it should be impounded so it could be properly processed. Uh, so we did, um, the keys had been transferred to me when I took over, so I had the keys to the vehicle. We then determined it should be towed back to police headquarters where it could be impounded inside so that nothing was disturbed. Could you please explain the process of how that tow would have happened, or how it did happen, I should say? So we contacted the department's on-duty wrecker, which was from town. They showed up on scene. I then, uh, wearing gloves, I entered the vehicle so that we could limit any kind of exposure to anyone else. We couldn't initially start the vehicle. Pars uh, First, because it was left in reverse, it was not actually in park. Secondly, because the battery was dead. So what we did is used a booster pack from the towing company to actually start it, which I did in the driver's seat, and then I drove it up onto the flatbed truck so it could be brought back to police headquarters. It was it brought back to police head headquarters? It was. It was then put inside uh, an impound bay of which I backed it off of the tow truck and parked it in the bay. Did you follow the vehicle, or the tow truck, I should say, from Lapham Road back to headquarters? Yes, I did. <coughs> why did why were you the person to enter the car again? Because I've been the only person that had been in the car, to our knowledge. So as far as police personnel went, I was the only one that entered it. Therefore, again, keeping any disturbance to a minimum. Uh, it, was just, it was the easiest way to take care of things. Uh, after the vehicle was uh, secured at headquarters, what did you do? I then responded to Wells Lane, the 69 Wells Lane, and met with Sergeant Albison from the state police, did a preliminary walkthrough of the scene, and then we began to canvas the area to see if we could find any security camera systems that may have picked up any activity in that area. When you say a preliminary walkthrough of the scene, what do you mean? I was shown the garage area and a basic uh, look at the kitchen area, and that was all. Did you walk through the rest of the house? Not at that time, no. <laughs> now, uh, well, where did you go after that? So we began with houses on Wells Lane, uh, actually just walking the area and looking for any exterior cameras mounted on any of the houses that could have potentially picked up any activity uh, the following, the previous day. Okay, sir, I'm gonna direct your attention to the screen <coughs> behind you, states four. Um, upper left corner indicates 69 Wells Lane. Do you recognize what's depicted upon that photograph? Yes, I do. What is it? That is an overhead view of Wells Lane, including 69 Wells and the other adjacent houses. Uh, just briefly, if I may, Your Honor, just if you can point it out. 
And if you can, sir, can you please just stand up and direct where 69 Wells Lane is? So I believe this should be 69 Wells Lane. Now, when you walked the neighborhood, where did you go? We looked at any house that had a view of the street, uh, specifically 54 Wells Lane. That we observed cameras mounted on the exterior of the residence that did pick up the street and would have shown anybody coming in or out, or at least we hoped it would at that time. If I can, sir, uh, when you say 54 Wells Lane, I'm actually going to zoom in a little bit. Is that 54 Wells Lane? Yes, it is. And why were you interested in this property? So we noted that there were cameras on the exterior. And if I can get if you back can, up. Please. Specifically, we noted there were cameras on the front of the house, this is the face that faces Wells Lane, and on the end of the house near the garage area and the parking court. Okay. And those appeared at that time, they would pick up the street view. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and what did you do once you noticed the cameras? We were able to make contact, uh, specifically with this residence, we were able to make contact with the owner uh, and asked him if we could review the system, which he agreed to. And we did actually look at it and noted that it picked up uh, views of the street from two locations, both the garage end and the face of the house, and reviewed it briefly. Uh, the owner was incredibly cooperative, did give us access to the unit. It was initially brought back to police headquarters to do a download of the hard drive which we were unsuccessful at the time because we couldn't get access and the owner wasn't sure how to access it. It was returned back to the owner's residence. It was reconnected. We were able to use his cell phone to review video from that day. At the time we targeted, uh, based on information we had, a morning section where we were able to pick up pictures or video rather of Jennifer Dulos's vehicle leaving in the morning and returning and then leaving for a second time and not returning. Now you, a couple questions about that. You watched the, you indicated there was a time frame that you were interested in. What was that time frame? It was in the morning from just before 8 a.m. Uh, through, at that time we weren't really sure, through at least noon. And did you watch that time frame on, I guess, at the property of 54 Wells? At the property initially we did, and that's when we noted her vehicle leaving, returning and leaving again. Now. You mentioned two cameras. If you wouldn't mind uh, standing up and approaching the screen and just pointing out where those cameras were located. So camera three is located on the south end of the house in the area of the driveway. And camera seven is located on the face of the house or the front facing out directly to Wells Lane. Okay. And Wells Lane, is that the road in front of 54 Wells? Yes, it is. And if you are heading towards the, I guess, upper left-hand corner, uh, what direction is that? It's effectively southbound. So in other words, if you're traveling in the road from here to here, that's roughly road southbound. Okay. Um, and is there a road on top of that? It that's intersects with Frogtown yeah. Road, which is in the picture here. I'll scroll back out. Okay. Would be located up here, although you can't quite see it in the trees. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, does Your Honor wish to break yes, up the time? The time is approximately one o'clock. We'll stand in our lunch and recess and. Resume at 2 o'clock. All rise.